Good evening, everybody. Tonight, we're going to learn a Rashi on this week's Parsha, Parsha Shmini. Parsha Shmini, Perik Yud, tells the story about the two sons of Ari, Nadav and Aviyu, who offered an offering of Ktairus, Echafs and Yud, six who offered an offering of Ketairis, of burning incense. Vayitnu v'aneish, v'yasimu alein Ketairis, they took their shovels, they put fire on it, they burnt incense on it. V'yakrivu l'fnei Hashem eish zara asher leitzivois. They offered to Hashem an alien, a foreign fire, which He did not command them. The result, v'tetzi yeish m'lifnei Hashem, a fire came out from Hashem and consumed them. Hashem and they died in the presence of Hashem. Zakdrashi in Potsik Bays, Perik Yud Potsik Bays. Rashi quotes the two words of the Pasik Vatetsayesh, and a fire came out, and he says, Rebelezer Oimir Rebelezer says, Le Mesu Bneyaden Ella Yudesha Hiru Allah Bifne Moshirab. The children of Aaron did not die only as a result of the fact that Hiru Allah they communicated. They gave a directive, a halacha, they communicated a verdict in the presence of Moshe their Rebbe. This is the reason for their death. Loi Mesu, it's the exclusive reason why they died, because in the presence of Moshe, they took the liberty to state a halacha, to state a verdict of behavior. Rabbi Shema Loimer, Suye Yayin Nechnesul Mikdush. The Bishmal says they died because they went into the Mikdash, they went into the sanctuary, intoxicated with wine, they were drunk. Teda a proof. Sha'achar Misasan after they died. Hizira Nisarim. Hashem warned the remainders, Aaron and his other two sons, Shalayikansu. They should not go in drunk to the sanctuary. Because we see right after the story, there's a commandment from Hashem to Aaron, don't drink wine when you're coming into the Ayal Mayad, when you're coming into the sanctuary, do not drink. So this is Rabbi Shmuel's proof. Since right after the story, he warns Aaron, Hashem warns Aaron not to come into the base of Mikdash drunk, Yayin v'sheicher al teish. Don't drink wine when you're going in. So why is he warning? Why is he communicating this warning now? Is dach mashma? It seems this indicates that this was the reason of death. And Rashi continues: Mashal lemelech shahayolay ben bayis v'chuli k'di isa b'vayikrab. A metaphor to understand this is from a king who had a ben bayis who had somebody living in his home, and Rashi says, etc., as is discussed in the Medrash of Yikra Rabba. And this is the end of Rashi. On this Rashi, when we reflect on these words of Rashi, there are many questions that come up. Question number one. Rashi wants to know why the children of Aaron died, and he gives two reasons, Rebbe Lezer's reason and Rebbe Shmuel's reason. The question, of course, is the Pasuk gives a reason. The Pasuk says that they offered an alien fire, Asher Loit Siva Oisam, which he did not command them, and a fire came out from God and consumed them. Yet Rashi feels a need to explain a reason. The Pasuk tells a reason, says a reason. Why the need for any reason in Rashi? Question number two. When Rashi gives us a reason, he changes what the Pasuk says. The Pasuk gives one reason, and Rashi gives two other reasons. It's not like Rashi is explaining the reason of the Pasuk. He gives other reasons. The Pasuk says the reason they passed away was because they offered an alien fire. 
comes Rashi and says, no, there's other two reasons. One reason, according to Rebbe Lezer, is because they gave a halacha. They said a halacha in front of their Rebbe Moshe. And the second reason, according to Rebbe Shmuel, is because they drank before they went into the sanctuary. And apparently these reasons are not indicated in the literal flow of the Pesukim. Now if Rashi was a Sefer that explored deeper layers of Torah, so we know every verse in Torah has Shivim Panam L'Torah, has 70 interpretations. Tarizal writes that every verse in Torah has 600,000 layers. Corresponding to each soul. So sometimes within the simple meaning of the Pasuk, there's another layer and a deeper layer and a deeper layer and a deeper layer. Rashi's objective is to explain Pshuti Shamikra. Rashi states this numerous times in Sefer Bereshis. I'm coming to explain the literal interpretation of the Pesukim. Yet Rashi gives us two reasons that are not indicated in the literal flow of the Pesukim. Which brings us to question number three. Rashi wants to explain the reasons why the children of Aaron died. So his headline, the words of the Pesukim that he quotes in the headline should have been, we would think, Vayamusu. Vayamusu, and they died. And then Rashi will explain the reasons why they died. Rebbe Lezer says, Loi meisu, only because they said Allah in front of Moshe. And Rebbe Shmuel says they died because they were drink, drunk when they went into the Beis HaMikdash. Rashi doesn't quote the word Vayamusu in the headline. He quotes two other words, Vatetze Eish, and fire went out. Apparently, his explanation is on the words Vayamusu, why they died. He's not explaining Vatetse Eish, the nature of the fire that went out, but these are the two words that he quotes in his headline, Vatetse Eish. Why? Question number four. It's well known that when Rashi brings two different explanations to explain one item, it's because each one still possesses a difficulty. And each one on its own is insufficient to cover all of the problems in the Pasuk. So that's why Rashi brings both of them. It is just, the one that he brings first explains the Pasuk a little better than the one he brings second, but there's still a difficulty, so he has to bring a second interpretation. So now the question is, why the need here for two explanations? He brings the opinion of Rebbe Lazar. apparently there's a difficulty with that, so he brings Rebbe Shmuel. Apparently there's a difficulty with Rebbe Shmuel, which is why he brought Rebbe Lazar. What is the difficulty in each of the two explanations? Which brings us to the fifth question. It's a well-known principle in Rashi. That in the majority of Rashi's, he quotes Gemara, he quotes Medrashim. And yet, usually, he does not quote the person who stated these explanations. Rashi quotes numerous ideas from different Tanoyim and Amairayim, from different authors in Gemara and Medrash, usually without a name. He just quotes what they said without who said it. Sometimes he does quote the name, and that's extremely significant. Why is it significant? Because Rashi feels that in these particular cases, knowing the name is helpful to understanding the message that they are communicating. The question is, why is the, are the names relevant here? Why does Rashi feel that we ought to know Rebbe Lezer said the first explanation, or Bishmol said the second? The sixth question and the final question is an interesting one. Rashi's words are meticulous. There are no excessive or superfluous words in Rashi. Yet when he quotes the marshal from Vayikra Rabbah, we are struck by an enigma. Rashi does not quote the whole marshal. He says, Marshal Lamelech Shahoyalai ben Bayis, Vichulu Kidiisib of Vayikra Rabbah. Here is the question. Rashi apparently does not want to tell us what the marshal is. He doesn't. From the words, Marshal Amalekh Shayyale Ben Bayis, you don't know the marshal. You just know there's a king who has a family member. That's it. What's the metaphor? What's the story? We don't know. That's why Rashi gives us a reference. He says, look into Vayikri Rabba, look into Medrash Rabba. In our Parsha, Parsha Shmini, Parsha Yidbeis, Piska Aleph, and Vayikri Rabba, you have the marshal. So Rashi doesn't want to tell us the marshal. He just wants to point his finger and say, go look there for the marshal. Granted. But then he could have written the reference in brief terms. He could have written, Marshal Lamelech V'chulu Kedisa B'Vayikri Rabbah. There's a metaphor of a king, as it says in V'Vayikri Rabbah. 
Rashi doesn't say that. Rashi says, ben bayis. In other words, he doesn't only want to make reference to the marshal. He wants to give us the marshal. But he doesn't. He stops in the middle. So it means Rashi does not want to tell us the marshal. And yet he feels that he has to add the words, ben bayis, because these words add something essential to his explanation. But what? What do we gain? What type of understanding do we glean from adding the word Shahayalay ben Bayis when I still do not know what the marshal is till I look into Medrash? In the Fabrengen of Shabbos, Parshas Shmini, Mevorchim Achaydish Iyer, Tavshin Chavav, Shabbos Shmini, 1966, the Rebbe at the Shabbos Dekha Fabrengen presented his explanation, his understanding of this Rashi the literal interpretation of the Rashi, and then he explained the Rashi also, Alpi Chassidus. There's the famous word, the famous statement of the Alter Rebbe, the Balatanya, that in Rashi's commentary on Chumash, you have Yeno Shal you have the wine of Torah. Wine of Torah represents the mysticism of Torah, the depth, the Pnimiyus of Torah. So he explained the Rashi, not only literally, but also the Yeno Shal the wine of Torah, showing the deeper layers and symbolisms conveyed in this Rashi. And some points of this Sikha I'm going to share with you this evening. Parts of the Sikha, not all of it, parts of the Sikha were published in Lakute Sikha's volume 12 in Parsha Shmini. The reason we start with question number Three, because this becomes the reference point through which we can understand the whole Rashi. The reason Rashi in the headline quotes the two words Vatetzeyesh and not the word Vayamusu is because it's these two words that explain to us the necessity for this Rashi. If Rashi would quote Vayamusu in the headline, we would be justified asking our first two questions. The Pasuk says why they died. Why give us a new explanation and why give us different explanations? By quoting in the headline the two words, Rashi is making clear to us that there is a tremendous problem. And it's this problem and enigma that he is attempting to address by quoting the opinions of Rebbe Lezer and Rebbe Yishmael as to the reason of their death. And the problem is the two words, Vatetzeyesh, out came a fire. What is the problem? Zak the Rebbe, you're learning Chumash. Not three, not four, two psukim ago. Two verses ago you had the same words, Vatetzeyesh. That tells us something. Said Vatetzeyesh, two psukim ago, Perik Tas Pasuk of Dalit, two psukim later, Perik Yud Pasuk Beis, again the same exact words, Vatetzeyesh. The two apparently are connected. The exact same terms are used in both cases. So let's look two psukim ago. What does Vatetzeyesh mean? So there's the story about Moshe and Aaron laying the groundwork for the Shechina to come down into the Mishkan, into the sanctuary, the first time the sanctuary was created and dedicated and put up. This is Rish Chodesh Nisan, the first day of Nisan in the year 2449 since creation. Moshe and Aaron come out, they bless the nation, and suddenly the nation sees the glory of God. A fire came out from Hashem. It consumed on the altar the offerings that were there. The nation saw, they began to praise. They fell on their face. Finally, finally, the Shechina descended in all of its majesty and glory on the Mizbeach in the Mishkan. The fire that came out was the symbol of the fact that the Shechina would now dwell in the Mishkan. And Rashi, a Pasuk earlier, gives us the context in which it happens. Rashi says 
that Aaron saw that all the offerings were offered, and still the Shekhinah did not come down. And he was aggravated and he said, I guess Hashem is angry at me and because of me the Shekhinah didn't come down. So Moshe, he tells his brother, Moshe, Moshe, this is what you did, I'm embarrassed. Moshe went in, they asked Rachamim, and the Shekhinah came down. And Rashi then continues and he says, for seven days, Moshe and Aaron were putting up the Mishkan and putting down the, and taking, taking apart the Mishkan. They're called the Shiva Simei Amiluyim, seven days earlier. And yet, not once did the Shechina dwell in the Mishkan. So the Jews felt terribly embarrassed. And they told Moshe, Moshe Rabbeinu, all the work and toil that we put in, in order that the Shechina should dwell among us and we should know that the sin of the golden calf was atoned, all of the work was in vain. The collecting the money and the contributions and the donations and the building and the designing. It was all in vain. Seven days the Mishkan is going up and the Shechina is not coming down. So Moshe told them, my brother Aaron, his contribution, his service is significant enough that through his karbonas, through his avayda, the Shechina will come down. And indeed, Rosh Chodesh Nissen, a fire came out, and when the Jews saw it, they were overwhelmed from joy. They began to extol, they began to sing, they began to dance. They fell on their face. Meaning that the Vatei Yesh two Pesukim ago, represent not just a positive thing, but an extraordinarily positive thing. Something so intense, so powerful, something that the Jews were waiting and waiting and waiting, and it represented to them the beginning of a new era. Finally, the sin of the golden calf has been atoned. So the words of Atayitzayesh, just two psukim ago, capture within them a great moment. One of the greatest moments in ancient Jewish history. A moment that they have been waiting for for months and months and months since they created the golden calf and they were seeking atonement. And now, two psukim later, the same words, Atayitzayesh. And in the most negative context, here the Atayitzayesh causes death. Here the Vatei Tzayesh consumes the lives of Aaron's two sons, not of an Aviyu. So the student is wondering, why would the Torah use the same exact words? Vatei Tzayesh, two psukim ago, represents something so positive. And the same words, Vatei Tzayesh, reflect and represent something so negative. The Vatei Tzayesh that's earlier did not come on its own. It took work and work. Moshe Rabbeinu couldn't accomplish it. Moshe Rabbeinu, seven days, he couldn't accomplish it. The eighth day it happened on Rosh Chodesh Nisan. In other words, to create that Vatei Tzayesh required <laughs> tremendous effort, tremendous sacrifice. And that's for something positive. And here, the same Vatei Tzayesh, the same words. One of the greatest... Songs. And yet it denotes something absolutely destructive and negative. This is the question that's bothering Rash. What does it mean? What does this mean? What is the Torah trying to hint? What is the Torah trying to convey? If the previous Vatei Tzayesh was something so difficult to create, it was something so alone, it's so blind and positive. This Vatei Tzayesh is something so negative and destructive. It's harder to create something positive than to create something negative when all know that. It's much easier to destroy than it is to build. How long does it take to build a friendship? How long does it take to destroy a friendship? How long does it take to build a home? How long does it take to destroy a home? So the previous Vatei Tzayesh took, to much, took so much effort. And here you have the same Vatei Tzayesh. And something destructive and negative. This is what's bothering Rashi. And because of this, Rashi tells us here, Gavaldik Echidish. He understands the psukim in a new way. Rashi says, you know what, you're right. You know why the Torah uses the same two words, Vatei Tzayesh? To tell you that the same thing that happened to psukim earlier happened here once again. What happened to psukim earlier? The Shechina was revealed in the Mishkan. That is what happened here again. Vatei Tzayesh, a tremendous is galus of the Shechina, a tremendous revelation of the Shechina. That is why the Pasuk uses the same words. It was the same experience, the positive experience there repeated itself here again. Vatei Tzayesh, the same words. How can you say such a thing? Two people died. What is Rashi telling us? They did not die only for one reason. 
What is the loy meisu? Why is he emphasizing it with the negative? Because he wants to tell us what the pasuk is telling us with the words vatetzayeshes that the act of Nadav and Avil in and of itself, the carbon that they brought, the kitaris that they offered, was something that had tremendous holiness to the extent that it generated a vatetzayesh identical to the vatetzayesh two psukim ago, representing the revelation of the Shekhinah and the Mishkan. But there was one issue. Loi Mesu, the only reason they died was not because <coughs> the Ktairis was vain or mundane. Because the act of sacrificing this in the presence of Moshe without consulting him, without seeking his advice, that is what caused this tremendous hisgalus of the Shechina to affect them in a negative way. Loi meisu, that's the reason. Moshe Rabbeinu is here, the Rebbe is here. Your Rebbe is here. And yet on their own they went and they offered the Ketodos without asking Moshe. That itself was the Hiru Halacha. That itself was, they didn't only say something verbally. They did something in the presence of Moshe. They could have asked him. For them to do something in the presence of when Moshe Rabbeinu was here, and yet they didn't consult him, they didn't ask him, they went ahead and they offered the Ketodos. This was the negative thing that caused their passing. But here you can ask a question. Because of such an act of not consulting Moshe Rabbeinu, of doing something in the presence of Moshe Rabbeinu, taking matters into your own hands and bringing Torahs. Because of that, they deserve to die. It's difficult to understand. That's why Rashi has to quote Rebelezer. Because when we know the name of Rebelezer, we can appreciate Rebelezer's perspective that this is the reason they died. It's knowing that Rebelezer's greatness in Torah is described by Chazal in unparalleled ways. The Medrash says in Pirkei, the Rebelezer paid a base. That they told Rebbe Lezer, you could tell us Torah more than what the Jewish people received at Mount Sinai. In Medrash Rashidim Rabba, it says that the stone, Rebbe Lezer was sitting on a stone and saying Torah. So they said, this stone upon which Rebbe Lezer sat is like Har Sinai. And Rebbe Lezer, who sat on the stone is like the Oren Habris with the Luchas on Har Sinai. So imagine Rebelezer's stone, the stone he's sitting, that's Mount Sinai. Why is it Ar Sinai? Because Rebelezer is on it. Rebelezer is the Luchas. Rebelezer is the Torah itself that's on Har Sinai. We know the Mishnah of his Pedic Beis, Rebelezer is described as Bur Suchainim Abitipa. That student who did not lose a single drop of Torah. He was Torah. He, uh, he is the Luchas Abris. He sits on the stone. That stone is Har Sinai. And yet in the Gemara in Brachas, the Avchavzayin Amit Beis comes Rebbe Lezer and says, Ha'aymer davar shaloy shama mipi rabbi. Somebody who says something that he did not, that he did not hear from his Rebbe. Goyrim l'shechina shetestalik mi Yisrael. He causes the Shechina to depart from the Jewish people. So Rebbe Lezer is telling us that notwithstanding one's greatness in Torah, the Beleza himself, his greatness and his unity and his depth of understanding and his memory is unparalleled and extraordinary. And yet, if you would come to the Beleza and you'd say, "Nu, no, tell me something on your own. The Beleza would say, if you say something not in the name of the Rebbe, your Rebbe, goyrim l'shechina shetestalik mi Yisro. So we can understand if somebody not only says something that he didn't hear from his Rebbe, but he says something new in front of his Rebbe, how serious that is in the eyes of Rebbe Lezer. And that's why it's Rebbe Lezer who says, Loi meisu bnei aren ela yidei shahidu alacha bifnei moishu Rebbe. And the words that Belezer chooses in Brachos are significant. Goyrim l'shechina shetestalik mi Yisro. Ah, 
This is what happens. The ktoiris that Nadav and Aviyu bring cause vatetzayesh. What does vatetzayesh symbolize? We explained the gilu of the Shechina, the revelation of the Shechina. But the way they did it, the fact that they did it without Moshe Rabbeinu's consent, in the presence of Moshe on their own, they went and they stated a halacha that they did not hear from Moshe Rabbeinu. That caused the opposite. That causes Shechina the Stalik Mishra. It caused the departure of the Shechina from the Jewish people, which resulted in their passing. Or to put it in different terms, <coughs> in more mystical terms, one could say, Nadav and Aviyu were such great tzaddikim that their lifeline was dependent upon their relationship with God. For them, a relationship with the Shekhinah wasn't a luxury. It was the very source of their life, like in a very conscious way, like a fish in water. You take the fish out of water, the fish has no choice but to die because you removed it from the source of its life. Not of an avi when they remove themselves from the Shekhinah. By by separating themselves on some level of from Moshe Rabbeinu, by becoming autonomous, by becoming independent from Moshe Rabbeinu, they detached themselves from their own source of life, which we will explain a little later in the Shir. Yet here, we have two questions. Question number one that's bothering Rashi. How is it really possible that Nadav and Aviyu should behave this way? Become autonomous from Moshe Rabbeinu. And not only quote something they didn't hear from their Rebbe, but do something in front of their Rebbe that they did not hear from him. Number two. There's a little bit of a paradox here. On one hand we're saying that Tetzayesh represents that they generated a revelation of the Shekhinah. On the other hand, was saying that by doing something in front of Moshe without his permission and consent, they caused the Shekhinah to depart from Israel. So how can both things happen simultaneously? It's like a mitzvah haba ba'aveira. They're generating, they're doing the mitzvah through an aveira, or they're generating the revelation of Shekhinah through doing something which removes the Shekhinah. How can both things happen? If Hayru Allah Bifnei Rabban removes the Shekhinah, how is it possible that through that they brought down the Shekhinah of Atayesh? This is the problem with Rebbe Lazar. So that's why Rashi brings a second explanation. Rabbi Shmoloimer. Rabbi Shmoloimer Suyeyayin Nechnesulim Mikdush. They went in drinking. This explanation of Rabbi Shmuel answers both questions. First of all, there's no question, how is this possible to happen? How can they do it? They were not commanded not to go into the Mishkan drunk. According to Rabbi Lezer, they did something that was clearly wrong before that. It violated the unity, the respect, the awe, the reverence, the connection with Moshe. But according to Rabbi Shmuel's opinion, they didn't do anything wrong technically because they were not commanded not to go into the Mishkan drunk. The commandment was given only later. This also explains how they could generate the revelation of the Shekhinah because since they did not do any Aveira, they did not violate the commandment of Hashem, so it was not a mitzvah, a baba, Aveira, so therefore, through this avoid of Ktairis, they can cause Vatetzayesh Dashra Sashchina. And now it's clear why Rashi says in Rabbi Shmuel, Teda proof that after they died, he warned the remainders that they shouldn't come and drunk to the Mishka. Rashi is not just explaining why suddenly Hashem tells Aaron, don't drink before you come into the Mishka. Rashi is telling us also something else. He's explaining to us the advantage of Rabbi Shmuel's explanation over Rabbi Eliezer's explanation. Because what Rashi is saying is, After they died, he warned the remainders not to come and drunk. Which means that according to Rabbi Shmuel, the children of Aaron did not transgress the commandment of Hashem while they offered the Ketoris because they were not commanded not to come and drunk. It's only Achar Misoson, after their death, that he warned them. 
If so, you might ask a big question. Why were they punished? According to Rebbe Lezer, I understand Rebbe Lezer believes that to detach from your Rebbe in front of him, Goyrim Lushchina Shatastalik, it has very severe consequences. According to Rebbe Yishmo, why were they punished? They were never commanded not to come in drunk. They were never commanded. It's unfair. That's why Rashi says, Moshul Lamelech Shahayaloi Ben Bayis. So in our last question, question number six, we asked, Memonav Shech. Rashi wants to bring the whole Moshul, bring the whole Moshul. You don't want to bring the whole Moshul, you just want to give reference, say Moshul Lamelech. Now we will understand the meticulousness in every word of Rashi. Tamuru. What does the Medrash say in Parshish Shemini? What's the story? The Medrash says there, Moshe Lamelech Shaiyale Ben Bayus Nema. There was a king who had a faithful Ben Bayus who lived with him in the home. One day the king finds him standing al Pesach Hanuyas. The man who lives in his home, who grew up in his home, is hanging out at the storefronts of stores. He's hanging out at the at the doors. <coughs> At storefronts, and the nature of the stores is that they are very immodest, profane places. As commentators say, they are stores where alcohol is being consumed in titanic and enormous quantities. So it's a place for drunkards, for alcoholics. Or it's stores in which promiscuous relationships are taking place. But whatever the case, these are storefronts in which a dignified, moral, high-standing human being should not be present. The king had him killed silently. And the king appointed a second Ben Bayes, a second resident in his home instead of the first. But nobody knew why he killed the first. It was done silently. Later they heard that he commanded the second Ben Bayes don't go to those storefronts that are promiscuous. Don't go to those storefronts that are profane. And now we know. If this is the warning. So now we know that's why he killed the first. So the Medrash says in Vayikra Rabbah, this is what happened here too. It says a fire came out and consumed them. We don't know why they died. Why? But since Hashem tells Aaron, Yayin v'sheicher al teich don't drink. Anu yoydin m'teich kach shalom meisolam apnei ayayin. Now we know they died because of drinking, because this is why he's warning Aaron don't drink. So everybody learns Rashi that Rashi is just quoting the Mosh. Rabbi Shmuel says they died drunk, and that's why he commands Aaron not to drink. So Rashi says Moshe l'Melech. But then the question is Shaiyale ben Bayis. But the MS is there's a whole new depth in this Rashi that we'll now understand. What's the word in the Medrash? Did the king command the first Ben Bayis not to go to these stores? No. The second one he commanded not to go to these stores. The first one he never did command. Two, not to hang out at these stores. So why did he punish him so severely? The answer is because he was a Ben Bayis. He was somebody living in the king's home. And since he's somebody living in the king's home... He could have and should have understood and felt on his own that this is not a place for him. This is why Rashi quotes the words to Hayole ben Bayez. Because this answers the question. Why were Bnei Aaron punished for something that they were not commanded on? If Hashem would have commanded them earlier, do not drink before going into the Mishkan. Grant. He never did. Achar son, he commanded them. Not before. That's the advantage of Rabbi Shmuel over Rabbi Lezer. This explains to us how they can generate the Shekhinah and how they can do it. So if that's the case, why were they punished? So Rashi says, Moshe Lamelech Shoyele Ben Bayez.